talking about. Uh, uh, would you care to replace the hand gesture? What? Yes. Uh, it's talking about money. Uh, Andy went like this, but I thought that most of you couldn't see it, so uh, I urged him to verbalize that. So, uh, these are people who in the beginning of the gospel were sending him money to support him in his preaching. And then, how does he describe their behavior in verse 16? What did they do then? Uh, and, what's that? Yes, and where was this? Yes, so they, they sent him help in Thessalonica once and again. So where during Paul's ministry does all of this take place? How do we plot this against what we know of the journeys of Paul? Anybody want to take a stab at chronology here? Yes. Yes. Uh, and I think you are exactly right, Gail, in identifying this with the second missionary journey. Because uh, look in your Bibles at Acts chapter 16. In Acts 16 and verse 12, uh, where do we see Paul going? Yes, uh, Paul and his companions go to Philippi. And when Paul goes to Philippi, what does he establish there? Yes, he establishes the church in Philippi that he is now writing to some years later. And then skip down to Acts 17 and verse 1. Where is Paul now? Thessalonica. And have there been any, uh, other than just, brief transitions to Amphipolis and Apollonia. Is there anything between Thessalonica and Philippi? No. Uh, Paul establishes a church in Philippi. The very next church that he establishes is in Thessalonica. So why does it make sense that Paul says that even in Thessalonica you sent me help once and again? Why is that an even? How long have these folks been Christians at this point? Yeah, maybe months, maybe even weeks. And for that matter, how long did Paul stay in Thessalonica for? According to verse 2. Yes, Paul is only in Thessalonica for just a matter of weeks. At least three, maybe a couple more, but certainly not any expansive period of time. So for the Philippians to send him help once and again, then how frequently are they doing this? O on this very frequently. And finally, uh, look at the events uh, described in uh, Acts 18, and then let's look at verses 3 through 5. Somebody with an NAS, uh, who wants to read that? Somebody with the New American Standard, read Acts 18, 3 through 5. Any volunteers? I like the, the NAS rendering here. Joe? Yes. Right. Thank you very much. And I, I really like the NAS rendering right there. I think it's clearer than the ESV about what is happening. But in verses 3 and 4, describe Paul's pattern of life here to me. What's he up to? Yes. 
Yes, all of you are correct. Throughout the week, he is making tents, and on the Sabbath, he is preaching. Is he doing this just because he's really felt a hankering for the old tent-making trade? Is that what's going on here? Yes. Uh, at this point, Paul is absolutely out of money. So the only way that he can keep body and soul together, even though he wants to preach all the time, is by making tents six out of seven days, and then on the Sabbath, uh, teaching the Jews. But then what happens in verse 5? Somebody shows up. Silas and Timothy, where did they come from? Macedonia. And once they show up, then what does Paul start doing? He starts preaching full time. Is it just that Paul decided, well, I don't really need to eat. Food is not that important. I'm just going to go, uh, go hard on the gospel the whole time. Yes, that is exactly what happened. Because uh, Philippi was a city in what Roman province? Macedonia. So what has happened is that Silas and Timothy have come from Macedonia they have come from Philippi, and they have brought from the church in Philippi the money that Paul needs to go back to preaching full-time. So back to Philippians 4 then. So now that we've seen what happens in Acts, how closely does this line up with what we read in verses 15 and 16? What's the match like? Yes, it ties together perfectly. Uh, and so why is that important? Why did I just spend all this time walking through the chronology of Acts 16 to Acts 18 and talking about uh, why it is that Paul went from preaching one day a week to preaching full time? And why is it important that all that lines up exactly with what we see in Philippians? Yes. That is definitely the, the impact in that day. Is It's obvious why Paul really appreciates these people. It's because they have been helping him almost from the day they obeyed the gospel. So uh, they show the, the value of supporting preachers. But why is this important to us? Harvey? So certainly today we have the opportunity to support preachers in other continents, which is something that, in fact, we do this very day. So that's true. But on a meta level, uh, what's the principle that we see spelled out in Deuteronomy? I think it's 19. It might be 18. I always get it wrong. Uh, so Deuteronomy 19 and verse 15. I was right. Uh, somebody want to read verse 15 of Deuteronomy 19 for me? Everybody is baffled as to where I am going. Uh, hopefully it will become clear. Doug? Uh huh? Uh, that's it. And even today, when we have two, di uh, two different people and they're telling different stories of the same event, at that point, do we really have any good way to determine who's telling the truth when you've got one on either side? No, it's just one side's word against another. And what actually happened is murky. But on the other hand, if you get two witnesses both accusing the same guy, then what do you have? Yeah, you have corroboration. And so what do, we, what do we get when we look at an account written by Luke about Paul 
and an account written by Paul about his own life, and these accounts line up with each other. What does that show? Uh, well, we, we do, although I think any of those verses would do that. But let's look at the Bible with a skeptical eye. Uh, let's take the claim that some make that Acts is just this sort of tissue of fables that people made up to uh, have this heartwarming story about the spread of Christianity, and really that's not how it went down at all. Uh, does that claim stand up to uh, Acts and Philippians telling the same story? No. Yes, exactly. You have two witnesses both saying that this is the same. And the point is that when you have all of these historical documents that are telling the same story, then it confirms the authenticity of both documents. They back each other up. And so that, once again, we see that the Bible is not just this tissue of fables, that instead it is history. These are historical documents. These are real people describing things that actually happened. Doug? Yes, that Paul did not put this in here to just sort of subtly bolster the historical credibility of the book of Acts. This is just his conversation with the Philippians about the financial relationship that they've had, and it coincidentally confirms that relationship. A year or two ago, I read a really neat book by a woman named Lydia McGrew about things like, the, there's actually a review of the book on my uh, on my website, or my blog. Uh, and what she calls this is consilience, and says that it is one of the most important evidences that we have for the historical books of the New Testament. She especially focuses on the Gospels. It's a, a really fascinating read for those of you who are into that kind of thing. Like talking about how the various accounts of the feeding of the 5,000 combine to establish the, a, a united picture, that they're all telling different details. A lot of the time, they don't really have a reason to mention a detail. They just do because it happened that way. But that detail explains something in another gospel. That with the strong implication being that the gospels are good history, just like the combination of Philippians plus Acts in this place shows A, that Philippians is genuine, and B, that Acts is good history. So when we are talking with our, our skeptic friends and neighbors, it is good to bring up stuff like this and ask, how come all these coincidental details in the narrative of the New Testament just happen to line up? Yeah, absolutely. That, that is one of the, the consequences of the claim that we make that the Bible is inspired by God, is that if it is inspired by God, then it must be inerrant and it must align with itself. And so that's something that uh, is important for us to point out as we go through the scriptures. Joe? Probably. Probably. Uh, it's hard to... And, and that might be, because I'm one of those that tends to think that the reason why Acts stops in Acts 28 and says, okay, Paul is in his apartment for two years, the end. That the reason why Acts ends that way is because that's as far as uh, the life of Paul had gotten, that 
Uh, Luke was writing the book of Acts two years into Paul's imprisonment. Uh, Philippians also took place somewhere in that imprisonment. Uh, I don't know that there is a good way to determine from Scripture how long his imprisonment was. But they may have been a couple years apart. That's certainly plausible. Anybody else? All right, then. Let's go on to uh, the next question. Uh, back to Philippians 4. According to verse 17 here, what is Paul not seeking? What is, what's that? Yeah, he is not seeking the gift. Is there anything about Paul's life that makes this statement very plausible? What, what makes it believable when Paul says, you know, I'm not really that concerned about money? What's that? Uh, uh, certainly the way that he lives, uh, the, uh, the fruit of his life shows that uh, he's not that interested in money. But think about, for instance, his relationship with the church in Corinth. Uh, what does he not take from the Corinthians? Yeah, he doesn't take money from the Corinthians and says, even though I could, I have never asked this from you, and then goes through to explain that. So is that the behavior that we see out of one of our modern-day televangelist types, that they could get money from somebody and they say, no, thanks, I won't do that? No. Uh, Paul, on the other hand, that is exactly what he does, that there were opportunities that he had to take money from churches and he turned them down. And so here when he says, I'm not really that interested in the gift, do we buy it? Yeah, we do. He's... Uh, this is, yes, uh, instead, what is he concerned with? Yes, yes, he says, I seek the fruit that increases to your credit because uh, Paul might be getting this deposit of funds from Philippi, but where are the Philippians getting a deposit of their own? That they are, by supporting Paul, laying up treasure where? In heaven. Exactly. And that's what he's talking about when he is talking about the fruit that increases to their credit. That really, they are benefiting from this more than Paul is. Because Paul is just getting earthly money. They are getting something that is going to matter on an eternal basis. So... What does this show us about Paul? What, is, what do we learn from this exchange where he says, uh, I am more concerned about your spiritual benefit than about my physical benefit? What is this? What's that? Yes. He is focused on them and not on him. And what else is he focused on? Is he a guy who is just all about the material world and material benefits? Yes, he is interested in spreading the kingdom. He is interested in spiritual benefits. And this, by the way, is a, an interesting study sometimes. Just go through uh, all of the prayers of Paul in his epistles. See how often he prays about physical stuff versus how often he prays about spiritual stuff. It's a pretty striking imbalance that, in fact, I don't think you ever see a time where he prays about anything physical, that instead all of his prayers are concerned with the spiritual. Uh, does that sometimes look a little bit different from our prayers? Yeah, that we are worried about the things of this world, even if it's Stuff like, you know, somebody we care about is sick and we want them to get better. There's nothing wrong with praying for somebody we love who is sick. But that is still not the most important thing. So, uh, what can we learn then from Paul about how to talk about contributing to the Lord's work? What is contributing to the Lord's work really about? Is it about the transfer of physical money to the church? That's, yes, 
that what is most important about it is spiritual fruit. And the problem here is, once again, all those money-grubbing TV preachers. That they have taken something that is holy and good and corrupted it in much the same way that adultery corrupts uh, what is honorable and good in marriage. That, that they've taken something and they, they've defiled it. And when we look back at the original here, it is literally true that when we contribute to the work of the church, we benefit more than the church does. And so when we're talking about this, and maybe I persuade some of you to think more seriously about giving that than you have before so that you give more, I've not helped the church, I have helped you. Because what is most important is that spiritual dimension of giving. Any, Dr. Clifford. Uh, that is exactly so. Uh, at, here, as elsewhere in Scripture, we see that in terms of organization, the early church is very simple. You had churches, you had preachers, and you had individual churches directly supporting preachers. And the uh, people have come up with all sorts of Baroque variations on that for various reasons but we simply don't see any of those variations in Scripture. And I think that that really confirms the wisdom of God, because the bigger and more elaborate an organization gets, does that organization typically get more efficient or does it get less efficient? Which way does it go? Less. Uh, do we, we consider models of efficiency like the federal government, and we understand clearly how, what direction this goes. Whereas when you just have a single church sending money to a single preacher, uh, do you have much leakage along the way? No, you have zero leakage. It is 100% efficient. That even though God's plan uh, is something that people have been trying to improve on for thousands of years, it really shows its wisdom once we start to think about it and about what its effects are. Anything else on this? Okay, then, let's look at question six. There, there's our typo for the lesson. Uh, there is no Philippians chapter five. But according to uh, verse uh, chapter four and verse 18, what has Paul received? Yes, he received full payment. And so because of that, what is his current status? Yes, he has everything that he needs. He is well supplied. And who was the, the guy who brought the gifts? Epaphroditus. You remember we met him back in Philippians 2. He was the guy who... Uh, along the way got so sick that they despaired of whether he was going to live or not, but he was the one who, despite his illness, successfully discharged his responsibility. And let me tell you, friends, 2,000 years ago, I would not have wanted to be the guy who was carrying around a large sum of money by myself. Uh, that sounds like a, a, a pretty hazardous road to walk. So, but what is their spiritual significance? So not only in a physical sense is Paul supplied, what has happened spiritually? Yes, it is a sacrifice. Uh, it is an offering. And let's pause here and consider this word sacrifice. Because uh, a lot of the time when we talk about quote-unquote sacrificial giving, I'm not sure that we are putting quite the right 
biblical spin on this. Because in our society, what does the word sacrifice usually uh, connote? What is its connotation? Yes, you are, you are surrendering something. It, it, it might hurt you. It's something that you wanted. But here you, you sacrificed it. You know, we, we sacrifice for the sake of our children, that kind of language. Is that really what Paul is talking about here? Uh, is, that, is this giving sacrificial in that sense? No. In what sense is it sacrificial? Andy? Yes. Uh, in, in the New Testament, a sacrifice is simply something uh, that you offer to God. That this is, Paul says, the equivalent of under the old law, them making that grain offering or that wave offering or whatever else from their first fruits. So what does this teach us then about the importance of giving in a spiritual sense? Uh, once again, we are, I think, butting up against that idea that somehow it is sordid, it's dirty to talk about money in a church context. Uh, what is it really? when we give of our means to the Lord's work. It, it is a sacrifice to God. Andy? Yeah, we're not giving to the church. We're not giving to the preachers. We're not, you know, we're giving to God. And in the other Yes, and that is the point, that when we consider giving of our means, uh, we, we have our, our list of the five acts of worship. I, I'm, I'm never quite sure why it's only five. I, I am not sure that preaching is ever described as worship, uh, but when we talk about the contribution, that is definitely worship, and this is the passage that we go to to establish that. And so we are honoring just as God just as much with our pocketbooks and our checkbooks as we do when we sing praises to him. Both of those things show that he is important to us. Exactly so. And this is a very different animal from anything else that we might do with our money. Because if we're walking down the street and there's that, that bum leaned up against the, the, the side of the building downtown, and he says, hey, buddy, give me some money. It'll, it, it'll help you more than it helps me. Uh, most of us probably are not going to buy that, even though, of course, there might be truth to that as well. But when we're talking about this in the context of supporting the Lord's work, that is something that is absolutely true. Because even though we live in a world where money is the most important thing, in the spiritual scheme, money is not the most important thing. And we are exchanging it for something that is more important. Uh, other thoughts? Uh, Andy, then Lee. Absolutely. And the, the great statement, I think, 
uh, of the meaning of Abel's sacrifice appears in Hebrews 11.3. And it's such a good point, I want to read it. Or Hebrews 11 and verse 4, which says, By faith Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous. God commending him by accepting his gifts. Yeah, who benefited from that sacrifice? Did, did, did God need the burned animal? God did not need the burned animal. Instead, who benefited? Abel. Because as a result of his sacrifice, God commended him as righteous. And that is the commendation that we still seek with our sacrifices today. Lee? Absolutely. And that is another such a good point that I'm going to go find another passage. Let's look at the tail end of First Chronicles, I think. Uh, one of the, the great prayers in Scripture. I think it's First Chronicles. I might be about to be embarrassed. Uh, but look at First uh, Chronicles 29. And here in verse 14, we see exactly the point that Lee made. Well, this is David, and they're in the middle of assembling all of this stuff to build the, the, the temple with. And David asks, But who am I, and what is my people, that we should be able thus to offer willingly? For all things come from you, and of your own have we given you. Uh, we are not giving anything to God. Uh, instead, it is very true that when we talk about giving back to God, that is exactly what we're doing. Because, folks, we don't any, own anything. We are just borrowing it from God for a time and giving his own back to him when he needs it. Uh, I thought I heard a comment over here as well. So Brother Whitney, speak up. Here. Yeah? Yeah. Absolutely. And that gets back to the, the discussion that the, the good doctor brought up a few minutes ago. When, it talks, when we talk about the way that we use our money, it is Im absolutely important that this church only use its money for things that God wants it to use, that wants that congregation to use the money for. You know, if you look around here, you're not going to see any coffee shops, you're not going to see any bookstores, you're not going to see any of those other things. Instead, uh, everything that comes in here is for a purpose that we see spelled out in the Bible. It is for preaching, it is for teaching, it is for helping Christians in need, it is for spreading the gospel to other places, just 100% New Testament first century stuff. So point well taken. Anybody else? Absolutely. And, you know, does the church 100% absolutely need uh, fully supported 100% full-time preachers? No. But does having those really help the Lord's work? Yes. Because I, I've talked about it in this class before. I'll talk about it again. What Sean and I get from being supported by this congregation is the gift of time. You, you free us from having to do some secular work to support our families so that we can do what we really want to do. And that means that 
You know, if any of you are on the job and the boss comes in and he finds you sitting there reading your Bible and you know, talking about the Bible with your coworker, he's probably not going to be real thrilled with that. He's going to say, you know, get back to work. But on the other hand, when Sean and I are sitting around at, our, at the table in Sean's office and one of the elders comes in to see us and they find us uh, sitting around and talking about the Bible, then you, know, you think they're displeased with that? <laughs> the Bible. Uh, and that means that we can, we just have the opportunity to learn so much more and, and to be so much more useful than we would be if we were working some secular job. So it, it really, this is another place where we see God's wisdom in setting up things the way that he did. Anybody else? Harvey. No, I'm pretty confident this is just talking about their heavenly treasure account. That they, they are making a deposit in the first national bank of heaven. Uh, that is the way in which benefit accrues to their account because they're helping Paul. Anything else? All right then. Uh, let's, let's look at question seven. According to verse 19, what will the result of the Philippians' generosity be for them? What will the consequence be? Because they are supporting Paul, what else is going to happen? God will supply their needs. And how will God do this? What's that? Uh, well, what does the text say? Yes. So, what's that? Yes. Uh, and on how many levels is this true? In what ways is God going to make sure that his generous people are going to be provided for? Yes. Uh, that is, I think, why Paul says, God will supply every need of yours. And so, does this mean that the, the televangelists are right when they uh, make you know, one of those, those sevenfold appeals and say, you, you give one dollar to me and you'll get seven back? Is that the point? No. But what is the point? We will be taken care of. That none of us will ever have to fear that because we have made a spiritual sacrifice like this, that we will go without as a result. Uh, that does not mean, of course, that God is just going to throw buckets full of money at us and make us rich, but he, it does mean that we will be taken care of, which is a, a, a reassuring promise, and this is not the only place that it's made. Carolyn? Yes, that, that is exactly true. And uh, a lot of the time, I think that in, in our society, we tend to get the two mixed up, that, that a lot of people think they have needs, but they actually have wants. So uh, God, God is not promising us uh, that we will move to a prestigious zip code because we have contributed to his work. But he does promise that we're not going to suffer because we have. Sean? Yes. Uh, don't be anxious about food. Don't be anxious about clothing. And I think that tells us the level at which God is promising to supply our needs. So you see it there. You also see it in 2 Corinthians and Paul's discussion there about how if you give generously, then you're still not going to have any lack. So what will the ultimate result be in verse 20?
Yes, that God is glorified. So how should all of this inform our perspective on money? When it comes to giving, do we have to be worried about being tight-fisted to make sure that we will have enough to get by on? No. God will take care of us. He promises us that he will. What else does it teach us, uh, Doug? Exactly so, and I think that's a great place to end this, is that when we are doing what God wants, we can be sure that he will take care of us. So thank you for your comments this evening and indeed throughout the entire class. All we missed out on was the very tail section of Philippians in which not much happens. So hopefully you enjoyed the class as much as I did. Thank you.